The sensors and feedback exercise asks you to add a distance sensor to your own model, or one of mine, and then write a control law that interacts somehow between external objects and the motion of the robot. So I want to talk through a couple of the details of the sample solution to think will help elucidate what I mean by a switching function and how I came up with the ad hoc example. So let's just look first at what the demo does. Here's the a, a version of the sample model. And if we run the simulator, we see the sensor lines turn red as there's active and sensing. And then as it encounters the purple obstacle, it oscillates a bit around it, kind of. Uh, and then at some point, it'll move off and do something different, and then eventually cycle back around. So that's the kind of core behavior. I want to kind of go through my thought process in how I created this. So um, let's go ahead and bring up the code for it, because that's really the, the bulk of it. The first thing to note, really, is that joint one moves while it's in the initial hunting phase. And then once it finds the target, it switches modes. And joint one is just stationary. So this is still a single axis controller. It's only the elbow joint, joint two, that's, that's involved. So I'm going to try to bring up the Python code here. We'll kind of walk through some details. The first thing is that there is kind of a core state variable, which is this tracking variable, um, which is just sort of a binary uh, between the hunting and tracking modes. So there's a, it's a very simple two-state state machine. So we can first look and see where that happens. So tracking is false, meaning it's in the hunting mode. Uh, motor 1 is set to a constant velocity. Uh, motor 2 is set to a constant position. So it holds a kind of crooked elbow and then moves around slowly in a counterclockwise direction. And then the one thing that happens here is the sensor value is red. And if it's less than the maximum range, 0.9, that means that something was seen. The sensor just sticks at the maximum range, 0.9, as long as it's pointing out into the vacuum, the vacuum, the empty space, the rest of the simulation. So once it triggers, it prints a message, it changes the value of the tracking flag to switch modes, and then it logs a couple values. It saves the, the range sensor into last distance. It, it saves the joint angle into last J2 angle saves a timestamp, and sort of sets an initial target velocity for J2. That's just a variable. So these are basically global variables that are used just to keep track of the controller's state. And I'm writing these still as kind of Python scripts, so I'm just using globals. At some point, this may shift to a better object-oriented structure, but this is uh, just a kind of scripted approach to writing the code. So let's look at the more meaningful part, which is the, tr the tracking part, where it's trying to oscillate. Uh, it, it assumes it's looking at target. It's trying to find the minimum distance representing some closest point and kind of track around that. The first thing to note is that um, motor one velocity just goes to zero, just stops moving the, the base joint. The, there is a timer. If the elapsed time is longer than some, uh, some four second threshold, then it just quits tracking. So that's some, some kind of behavior there to, to, to rest on an object for a while and then otherwise try to hunt off and it may not succeed at leaving the object. It might re-trigger it away, but eventually it'll leave the object. And that, that produces at least some behavior that doesn't get stuck in the long haul. So now down to the kind of main body of the switching function. So otherwise, if it's not timed out, it always, um, sorry, let me get this right. Uh, it always reads the elbow joint sensor just to know where it is. And then does some differencing to estimate a local gradient. And I'm going to do a, some graphics here on the whiteboard in a second to show what I mean by this. But what it's trying to do is find the relationship between the distance sensor and the motion of J2. And what one would expect is that uh, there's some local minimum that represents being where it should be. So before we look at the last bit of code here, let's go and do the analysis and try to see how this is formed. So let's consider um, just sort of the basic kinematics here. We have, um, we have some obstacle. There's a little off screen, that's fine. And we have the, the center of the joint axis. This is the elbow, effectively. And we're going to scan the elbow back and forth. And so what we're going to see is that we're going to sample the distance sensor along some, some cone of angles here. And we're going to get a range function. So for some given, for some given uh, theta, we're just going to assume that theta is 0 because we're going to use a relative angle here so that absolute magnitude doesn't matter. We're going to get some distance x. And the minimum would be the, the, the nearest point. That would be the lowest value of x. And then we're going to get some other uh, values of x along that oscillation. So if we go ahead and if we plot that as just as a function, let's think about x as a function of theta, where we, we don't know the exact shape. But basically, we know is that there is some minimum. Um, 
and there is some curve there, which uh, is a some function of the of the sort of triangle geometry of the um, the surface, which is a, the cylinder plus the fact that the the angle as they move angles move off, there's some um, other sort of angular deviation. But regardless, um, for this surface, we definitely have a minimum. For a flat surface, you'd have a very mild minimum because when you're pointed directly on the normal, there'd be some uh, some the minimum distance, and then there'd be a subtle change of distance as you move off the normal. Um, of course, there are going to be cases where if you had a convex, a concave object that you're looking at, at just the right sort of convexity, it might always return the same, or if it was, if it was concentric with the elbow, it would definitely always return the same distance. So there's plenty of cases where this would fail. But we're making a very simple assumption that we have either a flat or convex object, and then we get some kind of minimum in this function. So let's just think about what the slope of this looks like, right? So if we were to, to locally estimate, um, you know, the given uh, the, the tangents to this curve, we would get some slope, which is the derivative of x with respect to theta, which is just the slope at any given point of, of this particular curve of distance as a function of elbow angle. And now we can start to think of how we might seek out the minimum here. I mean, we want to go downhill on this curve. So the main thing to, to notice here is if you're moving toward the minimum from the left, you're moving in the positive joint direction, but the slope is negative. That would correspond to moving this direction, and we're seeing that the distance is decreasing. If we are moving toward the left, a decreasing joint angle, we would expect the, that slope to be positive. That's a positive slope, that's a negative slope, that's a negative direction, that's a positive direction. So the sign of dx d theta and the time derivative of theta, which is the velocity of the second joint, should have opposite sign. And that's the key observation that lets us form a switching controller, which we just sort of look at some values of these, of these numbers and then decide should we move positive or negative or not change, just to provide a little hysteresis to avoid kind of chatter or dead bend in some central state. So that's the kind of key observation. Let's take it one step further and think about what that policy looks like when we graph it out. So um, one more plot here. We're, gonna, we're plotting a policy now. And we're, we're, I'm just saying because I'm going to assume that theta dot, which is the joint velocity of this elbow joint, is our output. That's what we're choosing. And our input is going to be dx d theta. It's the slope that we're estimating, the local gradient of the, of the range function. And so we kind of know a priori that we have, basically we're going to be choosing just um, either a positive or negative velocity at constant magnitude. So our solutions have to fall upon some line here or some line here, which would represent the positive or negative velocity. And then we're just going to say our switching function is whenever the, um, the slope has a, I'm sorry, whenever the, uh, the, the gradient is negative, we want the positive velocity. Whenever the gradient is uh, positive, we want the negative velocity. So those red bars there represent our switching output. This is given this local estimate of the gradient, what velocity do we choose to move the joint at? And if we do one final plot, which is a little bit even more notional, let's do a phase plot of theta. A phase plot is a plot of a derivative versus a variable. Um, a, in this case, a velocity versus a position. So we kind of know already that, um, and we're gonna, we're gonna, not everything is determined here. So we're gonna kind of draw kind of more of a schematic sketch. But if we are at some, you know, neg slightly negative angle and we're moving in the positive direction, that would correspond to moving along this line where uh, we have, um, you know, we're moving at some constant, constant velocity, so it's a horizontal line, and we're moving in the positive direction, so we're moving toward the right as, as the angle increases. Sometime after we cross, you know, some wherever the, the sort of the minimum happens to be, uh, we're going to decide to change our command, and we're going to switch to uh, a negative velocity, which will then tend to move toward the left. This is a negative velocity. It's a below the axis, and it's moving toward the left. And in reality, the system has some inertia. It's not going to instantaneously switch. So we're going to get some path that kind of traces some, some rapid path there. The details depend upon the dynamics of the arm. And then the, the rest is symmetric here. Down here, uh, sometime after we switch over um, and find some minimum here, uh, it'll also then switch back up to the upper upper curve. And again, we'll have some, in, some inertia carrying that. So the system should find some orbit around the origin here where it, it moves forward, it moves back, it moves forward, it moves back. 
And um, there's no proof of stability here. We haven't like tried to set up a model of the arm or a model of the curvature and make strong assumptions about the stability or the kind of domain of attraction of this particular switching controller. Um, instead, we're going to just wing it. We're going to just do it empirically and try the simulator. And what I'm suggesting is like that is not a, a good solution for a, building a you know a robust provable system that can handle all sorts of contingencies. But for our purposes, which is like building ad hoc behaviors and kind of connections between sensor data and the physics of the robot, um, I think this is an adequate way to like quickly explore control ideas. So that is the um, that's the kind of basic sort of like like rationale behind how the switching controller works. So let's just jump back and look at the code, and I think it'll be become clear now that uh, these these particular plots I've made translate fairly lit, uh, straight in a straightforward way into just actual text of the code. So getting back into this lower part of the function here. Um, Remember, we left it off as we were estimating this gradient. So we're, we're, we're reading the sensor value, the range value each time. We're doing a finite difference, just a straightforward difference between the current value and the previous value. And the same thing for the joint angle to get a kind of uh, baseline estimate of the joint velocity. And because we're only looking at signs, we don't even need to worry about the time step here. We can just use these as, as uh, infinitesimal steps, just the differentials of the values without worrying about actually creating a, some kind of other derivative. So the first thing we do is we do a it's kind of a sanity check where we just compare that the um, if if the if the signals aren't changing we don't really get a good ratio or really good comparison of signs. So there's some sanity check that if the absolute value of either signal is less than this you know this chosen constant 0 0.002, which is in the case of the angle 0 0.002 radians, it's a very small angle. Or in the case of the distance, it's uh, two millimeters, which is um, really just two times the minimum the resolution of the sensor as it's configured. So for these cases where the signal is basically stationary, uh, we just let the velocity continue as it is. That adds a small history, what's called hysteresis. So the, the system will continue, kind of continue moving until it gets a, a more meaningful change, and then the thresholds are slightly different than in the positive versus negative directions, and that is a way of, of uh, reducing sort of chatter and kind of momentary instabilities. So the next thing that happens is if there is some signal there, if these, if either these both of these magnitudes are above that threshold, then we estimate basically dx d theta, and we do it by by dividing the two. So this is a small number divided by a small number that gets us um, an indication of whether the range value is increasing or decreasing uh, uh, by the delta of the second joint angle there. And then the, the logic is is once again just checking sign. If dx d theta is positive. And the velocity is also positive. That means it's time to do the switch. And we change the velocity to negative. So there in uh, line 123, um, actually, well, the way, the way it works is only, it prevents the message of the change. But if it's a positive velocity, it always sets a negative joint velocity. And then just to cut down on the console chatter is an if then, an if statement, just to detect the fact that the, when, the, when the moment that it reverses, it prints the message. And then the second clause then, if dx d theta is, is less than zero. Um, it can't be zero, remember, because the delta distance is, has got some finite value. Um, then it sets the command of velocity to a positive number. So that, that if else there is the switching function. And it basically just, it just maps the sign of dx d theta to a positive or negative value on the target velocity for j2. And then just to finish that out, we just issue the command. Motor 2 has the position set to infinity just to force it into a, a velocity control mode. And then the velocity command is issued, and then the velocity command is also just recorded for the next iteration of the loop. So the key really here is we just assume that if you uh, have a minimum of your range function, you can estimate this gradient, which is the derivative of the, of the range function with respect to a local motion of the joint. Um, we've looked at the fact that if the signs of those of the velocity and that derivative are opposite, then we are moving toward the minimum of the range function. And then just arbitrarily created a, a, a switching function, which uh, uses uh, that observation to decide when to choose velocities, and then manually tune some velocities which are low enough to hunt without getting too far outside the obstacle. So the failure modes I expect are if the obstacle is too small, then the oscillation will be big enough; it'll just leave and lose it right away. If the obstacle is the right concavity, it won't find a minimum, and then it will probably wander at the end. Um, and I'm sure there's other modes that this will fail for. That's the, that's the joy of this. 
Because the point of the exercise is to think about some way of creating a relationship such that the robot is responding to its environment, but then find ways to configure the environment by introducing obstacles or other robots or copies of itself such that some emergent dynamics start to, start to appear, and, and hopefully those can be shaped to give it some kind of character as a, as a, as a performance. So that's the essence, I think, of this exercise.